With all the uncertainty in the world, feeling safe at home has never been more important. That's why I want to talk to you about Simply Safe Home Security. They're longtime friends of Pass Gas, and for good reason. Simply Safe has made it easy to finally get comprehensive protection for your home. There's no technician or salesperson that needs to come and disrupt your house, and you don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fees or sign a two year contract. Okay, guys? There's a break in. Simply Safe uses real video surveillance to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. And that means police dispatch up to 350% faster than for a normal burglar alarm. Better than that, all this super comprehensive security comes to you all for just 50 cents a day. That's amazing. Listen up. Right now, when you head to simplysafe.com slash gas, our listeners will get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. That's simplysafe.com slash gas to make sure they know that our show sent you. From Simply Safe and all of us here at Pass Gas, wishing you safety and good health. Thank you, Simply Safe, for sponsoring this show. It was cold that evening. Not just the biting autumn air, but the concrete on which George Bess found himself lying on. Just moments before, George's driver was taking him home after a typical day at Renault headquarters in Boulogne Billancourt. But this trip ended unlike any other evening, because George would never make it to his front door. He lay on the cold ground, bleeding out from four gunshots to the chest. Two assailants fled the scene, abandoning the baby stroller they had hidden weapons inside. In seconds, Renault's president was dead. Who would want to kill the head of one of Europe's biggest automakers? How did he come to power in the first place? And what repercussions did this horrific act of violence have on the rest of the automotive world? This is the assassination of a Renault president. Damn, dude, Thanks, that intro dude. was fire. I legit just checked my windows and the calendar because I was like, it doesn't make sense that I'm getting chills. <laughs> it should be warming up right now. It's not. Uh, welcome to Past Gas, uh, <laughs> the Donut Automotive History Podcast. Home edition. Home, that's right. We're still inside, but that's okay because I'm having a great time with my boys. Uh, I am Nolan Sykes, joined as always uh, by my friends and co-hosts, one James Pumphrey. More power, baby! <laughs> and <laughs> Joe Weber. Fired up! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love your catchphrase, dude. <laughs> a great catchphrase. Uh, a little inappropriate, I think, for the topic today. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Today we are uh, talking about the assassination of George Bess. Uh, he was Renault's president, and he was uh, gunned down in front of his home. Very strange story. Uh, guys, how are, you, how are you guys doing right now? I'm good. Doing, doing great. I'm in my garage. Uh, I took the weekend and set it all up for like a workspace. And uh, It looks great. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Um, and... Yeah, so I'm happy in here, pretty stoked. It's sort of like in high school when you used to decorate your room and you didn't have any stuff. That's sort of the vibe in here, and it really like took me back. Do you have a Reservoir Dogs poster in there? <laughs> I, I'm, uh, honestly, I have a tab um, on eBay open, and I'm going to get a bunch of like lady and sports cars posters. <laughs> Shall we shall we get into it, boys? Yeah, I yeah. want to hear this story. All right. Well, let's do it. The story begins in an unlikely place. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Hell yeah, Kenosha. Yeah, you from where Melvin Gordon from the the San Diego Chargers is from. I mean the <laughs> LA Chargers. Uh so yeah, before we get to the killing of uh George Bess, we need to understand the history of a little American car maker called AMC and how they came to be. 
The Thomas B. Jeffrey Company had built cars in their humble Midwest plant since 1902, enjoying decent success for their size. In 1913, the company debuted the Jeffrey Quad, one of the world's first four-wheel drive trucks. The Army had requested a replacement for their four-mule wagon teams, and boy, did the Jeffrey Quad deliver. So the Quad uh, was powered by a 312 cubic inch four-banger called the Buddha. Uh, the engine and differential put the power to the uh, ground uh, in all kinds of terrains like dirt, mud, and snow. And Jeffrey even made a variant with four-wheel steering. This versatility would come in handy when the Army eventually used these trucks on the battlefields of World War I Europe. In 1916, former head of General Motors, Charles Nash, decided he'd run his own company and founded, you guessed it, Nash Motors. He quickly acquired the Thomas B. Jeffrey Company because, you know, he liked guys who named companies after their name <laughs> and continued building cars like the Jeffrey Quad, as well as new models. Nash also brought innovations like flow through ventilation, the process of getting cool or warm air from outside the cabin to inside the cabin into the mainstream. Very important innovation. Uh, very before important. that, it'd just be a very stuffy cabin where your farts yep. would just hang and it probably got really warm and humid in there. And I'm glad that they did yeah, this. Just, he's like, Hey, what, if, what if we like poked some holes in this box? And everyone's like, wow, I never, what a genius way to think Nash. Well, I've been smelling my farts for way too long. My wife won't ride in my horseless carriage with me due to my terrible, terrible farts. Charles Nash left the company in 1937 and chose a guy named George W. Mason to replace him. Mason had worked in the industry at companies like Studebaker, Chrysler, and for some enterprising brothers by the last name of Dodge. Yeah. Have you ever heard of him? This guy worked, uh, he was just like, he had his uh, hands in kind of the all of the early automakers. So he knew what the heck he was doing. He learned the ins and outs of the industry during its fledgling stages. But for the last 10 years, George had been working for appliance manufacturer Kelvinator. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> Whoa, dual uh, thought, dude. We both said hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Named for William Thompson, the first Baron Kelvin. This guy discovered absolute Zero, which, as you may know, is the lowest temperature possible in thermodynamics. It makes sense for a company that makes refrigerators to use his name. Yeah, I want my fridge to hit absolute zero so it takes seven hours for my pizza rolls to thaw out, for sure. Yeah, I don't want edible food. I want food that sticks to my tongue and face. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know that they, they tried to uh, get absolute zero on Earth? And they can't do it because the the vibrations from around the world heat it up just enough to keep it from absolute zero. Dude, I'm feeling those vibrations, man. <laughs> yeah, me too. Dude, if there's one thing I can say about Earth and like pretty much everybody says this, it's like vibes, dude. <laughs> yeah, everyone's <laughs> everyone says that. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Everyone's like, if you ask anyone from anywhere, even if they're not from Earth or whatever, you're like, hey, what about Earth? They're like <laughs> Oh, huh. vibes. Dude. Oh, you know, you've you never the, been, the... but I heard the vibes are pretty on point. <laughs> <laughs> I heard they can't even reach absolute zero, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's pretty chill. <laughs> Nash named Mason his successor, but George had a catch. If Charles wanted George to run Nash Motors, Nash would have to buy a controlling stake in Kelvinator and merge the company into the automaker. Uh, George complied, and the company was then known as Nash Kelvinator. The experience Kelvinator had with cool air appliances allowed Nash to make another huge innovation in their cars, air conditioning, which I am also toot, toot. yeah very thankful, <laughs> extremely thankful for. If there's one, That's my number one car innovation. Yeah, I think so too. It's like indoor plumbing, car mm. air conditioning, yeah, uh, uh, pizza rolls. Pizza rolls. Yeah. <laughs> Penicillin. Eh, yeah, close fourth. <laughs> Shortly after the merger, Nash Kelvinator found themselves producing war machines once again with the outbreak of World War II. I mean, everybody who manufactured 
anything <laughs> uh, anywhere in the entire world. You know, we cover like a lot of history stuff, both in this uh, and in Up to Speed and Wheelhouse even. Um, world War One happened. They stopped doing what they were doing and started building stuff for World War One. And then they're like, OK, let's go back to doing what we were doing. And they do it for a couple of years. And then it's like ah, another one. And then it's like DJ Khaled, another one. <laughs> and th then they got to like, it's like, all right, I guess we're not making cars or refrigerators or anything right now. We're making planes and bullets and stuff. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, which is sort of what's happening right now with respirators. Well, I mean, remember back to the uh, Ferrari uh, episodes that we first started out with. Um, it was Alfa Romeo was had to make uh, trucks, you know, war trucks as well at the same time. Yeah, Alfa Romeo um gm ford uh uh harley davidson harley davidson uh who else any anybody volkswagen uh they were on the bad guys team fender guitars um, they had to make war guitars <laughs> I thought you were watch out <laughs> <laughs> i thought you're gonna be serious <laughs> <laughs> So Nash Kelvinator began their wartime output in late 1941 when they started producing the Pratt and Whitney R2808 Double Wasp. Coolest this name air ever, cool, dude. dude. Double uh, Wasp? How many wasps? Two yeah. wasps. <laughs> Two. What's, hey, what's, the, what's the scariest bug? A, I don't know, a bee? No, scarier. Uh, a big bee? <laughs> no, a wasp. Oh, yeah, that is pretty scary. Two of them. Oh, fuck. <laughs> this air-cooled, two-speed, supercharged radial aircraft engine had a capacity of 46 <laughs> liters oh and could God. produce 2,000 horsepower. I'm sure Jay Leno has a car powered by Probably. one of these. <laughs> this engine was used in Navy fighters such as the F4U Corsair, yeah. a plane with bent up. That's one of those ones that... Um, it's it has, it's wings, wings are very... Bend up. Yeah, its wings are very curved upward. Um because like at the bottom, at the bottom part of that curve, that's where they put the landing craft, and that's so they could put a bigger propeller on the plane to help it take off oh. and uh, go faster. From because it had to take off from a ship. From a ship, that's correct. Yeah, from yeah. a carrier. I, the Navy. Shouts to my Navy boys. Uh, I thought about joining the Navy for a long time, um, wow. and dude, just like aircraft carriers are the sickest stuff. Yeah, they're, they're insane, so man. cool. So much going just on. Like, dude, giant city on the water that they launch fighter jets off of yeah. no this is what i thought the fru corsair so like it's one of those bendy up wing guys yeah yeah i, I can tell yeah. you like spent time uh looking into joining the navy because you you know they have the terminology now <laughs> <laughs> yeah the official term the bendy up wing guys no but like the wings aren't only like um bowed they also fit fold the larger up. propeller yeah. They fold up so you can fit a, a lot more of them on a ship. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. that's why. That's yeah. cool. Nash Kelvin also developed a variant of the F6F Hellcat and another for the fearsome Northrop P61 Black Widow. Hell yeah. A twin engine, twin tail boom fighter designed specifically to fight at night. Hell yeah. These things are so yeah, sick. Dude. These planes were typically painted dark colors like black and dark blue to blend in against the night sky and hunted their prey with onboard radar. It was the first of its kind. Nash Kelvinator was also the largest American producer of the most advanced yet overlooked machines of World War II. Helicopters. That's right. Uh, while most people associate helicopters with the Vietnam War and airborne cavalry, Rotor-driven aircraft were not uncommon during Dub Dub 2. Both the Axis and Allied powers relied on helicopters for uh, reconnaissance, search and rescue, and, uh, of course, supply runs. Uh, Nazi Germany was the first country to pioneer rotor-driven technology and used helicopters as a powerful propaganda tool, flying their advanced machines as a show of military might and engineering prowess. A Russian immigrant to the U.S. by the name of Igor Sikorsky started his own aviation firm in 1923, and by World War II, he was constructing helicopters for the U.S. Demand was so high for these aircraft that Sikorsky had to contract production to outside firms, uh, which is, uh, as James mentioned, something pretty much every manufacturer did in wartime. That's also how Nash Kelvinator ended up producing those Pratt and Whitney engines. Nash Kelvinator was contracted by Sikorsky to produce the R6A helicopter. 
a two-seater craft that could reach a top speed of 100 miles an hour. The British Royal Air Force used these helicopters to great effect in airborne observation roles. What they would do is like spot for artillery batteries mile, miles away. And, you know, they'd call out if, uh, if the shots were getting close to their target or not. Um, Nash Kelvinator was able to produce over A little two to the right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going back up. <laughs> Nash Kelvinator was able to produce 200 of these aircraft over the course of the war, which is more than Sikorsky and the rest of the aviation industry combined. Dude, I can't imagine anything more terrifying than riding 100 miles an hour in like a 1946 helicopter. Oh my God, that's so scary. Like old cars, yeah, old cars are like pretty, you know, wonky to drive. Uh, like the inputs aren't very good and they're like kind of floaty and rickety at the same time. And there's no seat belts or anything. But you just imagine being like. <laughs> well, when the war ended, Nash Kelvinator pivoted back to customer automobile production. Uh, another company with a similar trajectory was Hudson Motor Car Company based in None other than Detroit, Michigan. After the war, Hudson debuted new models, including the Super 6, which was notable for being about a foot lower than the competition, yeah, but dude, having the same boy. amount of room inside. Dude, sleek. Just like low. They're so Just sick. It's like the lunchiest Stratus of its time. I really want one of these things, man. They're so cool looking. I'm really... I wish... Be because of the script, I'm like super into like post-war uh, sedans now. Uh, the older I get, the more I like stuff like that. Like when I was younger, I was like, why would you even care? But I don't know if I mentioned this in the last podcast, but it's still going. Uh, I was the other day I was like watching um, Little Women with Casey. And, OK, it's you know, we're watching a lot of stuff. It's quarantine. And uh, I, I found myself being like, man, that is a nice carriage. <laughs> <laughs> Like, look how I wonder sleek who the coach kid. builder was. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, I like can totally see like 50 year old me. Like that's my like project is <laughs> I like have a barn and I'm restoring this like 1919 horse drawn carriage. <laughs> just like it's like period correct, but I'm making a few upgrades. Yeah, yeah it's slammed. You put some you put some rotiforms on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's like just dumped on bags. <laughs> I, would, I, I kind of want to see that now. That's <laughs> yeah, dude. Just like, just a ripped horse. Like <laughs> no, I got no. this horse. No, you got to slam the horse too. You have like a like a little <laughs> like a little yeah. miniature horse. <laughs> yeah, just like a short but like stocky like super meatball, buff ball buff horse. Just like the buffest horse. I got him from Hungary. They're they're the only people that make this kind of horse. He's All he eats fast. is creatine. <laughs> yeah, he eats, he, he's one of the only, they're the only horse breed who eats meat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, he's not fast, but he, he'll pull a stump out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the diesel horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's his name, Joe. That's his name. Oh, dude. This gets, his name is <laughs> Diesel dude. Vincent Diesel. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the, <laughs> the Super 6 was, again, notable for being lower than the competition, um, but having the same amount of room. Uh, the advanced unibody chassis had a very low center of gravity, which improved cornering ability. Hudson embraced performance with the release of the Hudson Hornet. Uh, if you've ever seen Cars, that is a Hudson, the old, old Hud, guy. Yeah, he's right? the Hudson Hornet. Is yeah. A, yeah, he's the Hudson Hornet. It was a two-door coupe powered by a big bore, 308 cubic inch straight six engine the engine's dual carburetor setup meant the hornet could not only hang with v8 powered competitors like the chevy at ovals but it could beat them too the hudson hornet cleaned up at circle tracks through the late 40s and early 50s and according to one allpar.com article great website great website the racing success might have been the only thing keeping the large hudson coupe in production this kind of flies in the face of the old racing adage, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. And the Hornet wasn't doing big numbers, but Hudson kept it around because it was kicking absolute booty toot on the track. Yeah, it was so dominant, but Hudson was still a pretty small automaker. They weren't selling, they weren't competing with Chevy sales wise, but because, uh, because they, 
just kicked Chevy's ass so hard. They they had they had no choice but to keep it in production, you know. All right, so why are we talking about Hudson? Well, back at Nash Kelvinator, George Mason had a realization. He knew that Nash's relatively small size allowed the company to experiment with their car designs, and that was great. But Nash Kelvinator didn't quite have the same oomph to take the fight to the big three. That, that was Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. Uh, Nash Kelvinator, the product of one merger, would have to merge again with other like-minded companies. Who George had in mind was Studebaker, Packard, and Hudson. Unfortunately, Stude and Packer were not interested in a merger, but Packard would later partner with the new company. Uh, on May 1st, 1954, Nash Kelvinator formally merged with Hudson Motors, and so began the American Motor Company, also known as AMC. Is it Boom. Uh, Mitt Romney's dad? Wasn't he the president of AMC? Damn it, Joe. I had a reveal. <laughs> Did I f- <laughs> nah, sorry. You know too much. <laughs> you know too much. Know. <laughs> well, Joe, uh, what are you right? What are you like, right about cars for a living? <laughs> Here. <laughs> also, just, just heard about this. Here's a little tidbit. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, Mitt Romney's dad or a different president, but did Mitt, not, president did Mitt Romney of, was no, no. not a president. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm talking about the president of AMC. His dad. Oh. Uh, if he thought that he was paid too much in a year, he would uh, forego his salary if, you know, pending if he thought he was being paid too much or not. That's pretty cool. Like based on his performance? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's, it's like a Japanese thing, right? Don't they, a lot of CEOs in Japan do that? That's interesting. But I saw Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, forego his salary this year. So I guess now he only has infinite money <laughs> it's like so oh i cool. made him richer <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, yeah yeah i don't have to pay taxes this year so uh <laughs> i am richer sadly yeah. though james george mason would not live <laughs> to see his plan through to completion uh just five months after the merger george passed away due to complications with pancreat pancreatitis and pneumonia uh he the, was, the the double p yeah that is a uh that's a really bad one-two punch there. Uh, he was 63. Yeah, you heard at the top, you heard at the bottom. Yeah, he was 63 years old. His replacement was his protege and AMC's vice president, a man born in a Mormon colony south of the border in Chihuahua, Mexico, and who would later become Michigan's governor in 1962. Uh, do you guys want to take any guesses as to what his name was? <laughs> uh, Joseph Smith. Uh, George. Uh, George. L W, but <laughs> it, it, it was George Romney, uh, as Joe said earlier. George Romney. I'm really sorry, I, I ruined that. <laughs> it's okay. No, that's, you just know a lot. It's fine, uh, George. <laughs> you know a lot. It's fine. It's like didn't ruin my plan at all. <laughs> uh, George got busy making sure his mentor's plan came to fruition, which he was fully equipped to do. He had met Mason when he was working at the American Manufacturers Association. And Mason, Shout out to the AMA. That's, and uh, I don't think they're around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to all my bros in the AMA. Uh, and Mason took George under his wing around the same time as the Nash Kelvinator merger. He's like, hey, kid, you got Moxie. Even though he's probably like 40 at the time. That's how people say it. That's very accurate lingo for the time. Norman. Probably. I could tell you yeah, and doing your research. <laughs> and 40 was young for someone, you know, an executive at the time. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I peep in the forties and like fifties, people used to live to be 175 years old. <laughs> the merger allowed AMC to utilize the strengths of all the companies under its umbrella. The Hornet was allowed to live and would become AMC's medium sedan complete with a new Packard supplied V8. So it got rid of that dual car uh, straight six. Now it's got the V8. Uh, Nash's Rambler and Metropolitan would cover the compact side and uh, small cars were actually very important to George Romney. He knew that AMC, while larger than ever before, still couldn't take the big three head on with large cars. He believed that if AMC was going to survive, they would have to find their own little pocket in the market and then jam it full of small cars. Just fill it. So in 1957, <laughs> the Hudson and Nash nameplates were dropped and the Rambler model name became its own brand. 
The next year, AMC debuted the all-new Rambler American, a small sedan with a size somewhere in between a Volkswagen Beetle and like a typical normal like American sedan of the time. The timing of the release could not have been more perfect as a recession had just hit making economical and efficient cars like the American very appealing to customers. George's hunch paid off and sales doubled in 1958 compared to the previous year. Apparently, small was big. Nice, James. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Compact cars weren't the only standout models AMC had in the stable. Despite Rambler being laser-focused on economy, releasing ads with slogans like, why don't we enter high-performance Rambler V8s in racing? Because the only race Rambler cares about is the human race. Nice. That's wow. a weird campaign. <laughs> That's long. <laughs> it kind of, yeah, it doesn't really uh, roll off the tongue very well. Uh Oh, uh, wait, maybe I can deliver it better. I think I can deliver it better. All right. This is like how I feel like it was pitched. All right, let's in hear the it. Room. Let's hear it. So it's like, you know, see the poster right behind it, it. Things covered it up. It's like, why don't we enter high performance Rambler V8s in racing? And like all the exec, that's the ad guy talking. That's the Don Draper. Yeah. And then all the execs get like nervous because they've already told him they don't want to mention that. Okay. They don't want to yeah. bring it up. Like, oh God, what's this guy doing? And then he pulls the reveal because the only race Rambler cares about is the human race. Oh, yeah, I love it. Oh, yeah, I love it. Oh, okay, really okay. good. Yeah, yeah. you, you See, had me I, nervous there for a sec. Yeah. Can, I give, a, and then he can just, I give my take on it? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. I think it's more of just like a joker. So oh, he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we enter? High performance Rambler V eights in racing, <laughs> because because the only race Rambler cares about is the human race. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I could see that happening too. Definitely. I think they were thinking about the Joker when that came. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think Batman had just come out, so like the Joker, I think had just premiered in like. Detective comic number 11 or something earlier that week. I think I actually read this, Joe. I think you're right. <laughs> and uh, and Heath Ledger's Joker was based on that Joker from that comic. From the yeah. Rambler ad. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Rambler still needed to put out a performance car of their own. So they combined their compact platform, their smallest car, with the big V8 from their biggest car, the Ambassador. So, basically, classic move. Uh, John DeLorean did this, too. Um, just take the biggest. So did Carol Shelby. And, like, every time it happens, people are like, whoa, wow, we didn't think of that. And it's just like, <laughs> hey, what if we took the biggest motor and put it in the smallest car? It's like, oh, it turns out it's faster. <laughs> uh, the four-door sedan weighed just over... 3,300 pounds, and the 327 cubic inch engine made 255 horsepower, which gave the car a superb power-to-weight ratio. The appropriately named Rambler Rebel hell yeah. was the fastest. Fo yeah, hell yeah, dude! Was the fastest four-door car for sale in the U.S. Second in speed only to the Chevy Corvette. It could be argued that the Rebel is America's first muscle car. The Rebel was available with only one paint option, metallic silver with gold trim down the side. Oh, that sounds but, cool. Yeah, it cost $2,786 or about 26000 bucks today. Uh, Rambler produced 1,500 Rebels, which meant it, Rambler rare. only produced... Yeah, they only <laughs> made about 1,500 of these cars, which means they're probably really hard to find, Yeah, uh, I, which I, I know this is 100% a Nolan car. Oh, dude, it's so ugly. Uh, but it's, it really? it's pretty, it's pretty, it, the, the styling is not aged well, but I would, I would really love to find one of these things there. I, I just think they're so cool. I mean, it's basically like an American M3 in the fifth from the fifties, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. it's so cool. I love it. Drop it down a little what bit. I said about that color scheme. It's pretty gnarly. It kind of <laughs> sucks. It's a yeah, <laughs> yeah. I agree, Joe. When I heard it, I was like, "Oh, I bet that looks great." That's like Ricky Bobby's dad's car. <laughs> no, it's but it's, it's not. It's, it's not really gold. It's more of a copper. It's it's yeah. polarizing for sure. Um, <laughs> no, I would love to find one of those. 
drop it down on some bags maybe or like really low suspension uh <laughs> i think it'd be sweet. we just want to take old like stuff and bag it yeah <laughs> like you and me when we're old are just gonna be at like bob's big boy and <laughs> you're gonna have like <laughs> in burbank Hell yeah. you're gonna have like a bagged rambler and i'll be with like my yeah. bagged horseless Horse carriage, carriage. <laughs> Another vanilla milkshake, toots. <laughs> Don't make it too spicy this time. Last time you made it too spicy. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in Europe, uh, <laughs> France was still recovering from World War II. Under German occupation, a provisional puppet government was set in place called the Vichy. The Germans had claim over northern and western France and allowed the Vichy government to watch over the rest. This saved the Nazis considerable administrative labor and also allowed them to lean on the Vichy to make sure resistance was kept to a minimum. The Vichy government had their own militia separate from the French military whose only task was to find and neutralize pockets of French freedom fighters. It should go without saying, but after the war, the Vichy were not popular people. In a 1946 speech, former General Charles de Gaulle uh, laid out his vision for post-war France, highlighted by an executive branch separate from Congress. He would not... Nolan, it's Charles de Gaulle. I can't do French. I'm just going to tr- pronounce it my way. Uh, <laughs> he would not be the president for over 10 years, but his vision for France was popular nonetheless. Things really started getting crazy when one of France's territories, Algeria, started fighting for independence. European colonists in Algeria, around one million people, were worried that France would forget about them if Algeria did break free. So the French army within Algeria eventually gained power, which spurred fear back in home in France that coups might happen in the rest of France's territories. So the government dissolved itself in 1958, and Charles, Charles, sorry, Charles de Gaulle was entrusted with writing the new constitution. I think that's that like, was pretty good. Yeah, that's like sort of like eerily responsible, right? Like basically from my understanding, they were like, hey, like I think these guys are going to resist us. So, and we're like basically everywhere right now. Apparently we messed up. Why don't we just start from scratch? <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> right? Well, I was talking about Nolan's pronunciation of Charles de Gaulle. Oh. Uh, But I agree with you. Charles established an executive branch with a president and a prime minister, which took away some power from the Senate and National Assembly. That's what they call their Congress. But in some citizens' eyes, this action could have been seen as a direct power grab from the French people and working class. De Gaulle must have uh, realized this, and in 1962, he pushed for an amendment to the Constitution that made the presidency a popularly democratic elected position. So at first, it was just like, all right, I'm president now. And then now it's elected. Uh, De Gaulle became France's first elected president since 1848 in 1965. And he held the position until 1968 after 10 years in office. Uh, I'm telling you guys this so you get an idea for the kind of place France was back then. It was still a place that remembered how Germany had treated them. uh, Remembered how some of their own countrymen had sold out resistance fighters. A place that finally returned to normalcy. It was a tumultuous time. A time that bred a few revolutionaries. Ooh, foreshadowing. Yeah, Nolan, I couldn't tell that you were foreshadowing because you didn't talk out of the side of your mouth. (laughs) I've... No! (laughs) I'm not going to bring that back. Joe really dislikes it, so I'm not going to do it. (laughs) You're a good friend. You're a good friend. (laughs) A time that bred a few revolutionaries. Oh, no! (laughs) Well, back in America... AMC was struggling. George Romney's small economy cars that had lifted the company up just a few years before were no longer viable. The recession was over and people had money to spend on fun cars, fast cars. The muscle car era that the Rambler helped ignite 10 years before was now in full swing, baby. The rising popularity of pro stock drag racing meant that the cars people saw at the strip were readily available in the showroom. Offerings from the big three like the Charger, the Grand Torino, the Chevelle, they were all tearing off of dealer lots. Gas was cheap and Americans wanted that sweet, sweet hearse purse, baby. Now, in addition to the OG Rambler, which entered its fifth generation in 1968, AMC also introduced what would become its most famous model. 
AMC needed an answer to Detroit's pony cars, the Mustang and the Camaro. The Mustang in particular was a freaking game changer for the industry. It was cheap. It was fun. And Ford sold literally millions of them. Venture capitalist Robert Beverly Evans saw what Ford was doing and thought AMC should do the same. So he bought 200,000 shares of AMC and quickly gained a seat on the board of directors. AMC's mission was to beat Mustang. To do that, they built a car named after a stick that you throw. <laughs> the spear. It was. Ah, oh, no, close, close. The, uh, the AMC. Uh, uh, the fetch. The fetch. It's the harpoon. Uh, harpoon. Uh, no, no. You're warmer. Uh, stick that you throw. Uh, uh, nunchuck. No. Um, that's two sticks <laughs> the devil stick the diabolos uh <laughs> it was called the amc javelin ah there you ah, go oh man now the javelin shared many characteristics with the mustang it was two-door coupe with fastback styling that looked like it was made for the racetrack so amc took it to the racetrack but they didn't go the typical route and race it at nascar ovals just yet as executive vice president Roy Chapin didn't think they could compete with the established programs like Ford and GM. AMC took the Javelin racing. Now I'm talking honestly, as far as like the way cars look, this is the coolest kind of racing, I think, in the history of in racing. In terms of That's looks. what I personally think. Yeah. I'm talking about Trans Am racing. Yeah, road racing, baby. The Sports Car Club of America's Group 2 was the place to be for amateur racers looking to prove their worth behind the wheel of the two-door sports car. Group 2 had three classes based on engine displacement. Anywhere from less than one liter, I can't imagine what kind of cars those were, <laughs> uh, all the way to five liters. Uh, in the series' first in the series' first year, the SCCA hosted 50 Group 2 races all across the U.S., Clearly, the idea of racing America's best passenger cars around our most iconic racetracks was very popular. And so began the Trans-American Sedan Championship. Uh, so that's that was the series for the pros because mm -hmm. Group 2 was for amateurs. According to thecarsource.com, quote, This series of races was made up of seven professional races at different tracks across the U.S. The manufacturer with the most points at the end of the series would win the first ever manufacturer's trophy. The Trans Am races, as it became known, ranged from 200 miles to 2,400 miles. The races ran from two hours to 24 hours and required pit stops for gas and tires. Uh, there are now just two classes, less than two liters and more than two liters. That's it, with the cutoff at five liters or 305 cubic inches. The early dominator of Trans Am was none other than our boy, Carroll Shelby. And his, whoop, whoop. GT, and his GT 350s based off the Ford Mustang. Back at AMC, Roy Chapman figured for AMC to become cool, the Javelin would have to become the dominant force in Trans Am, just like Shelby had done with his pony cars. There was just one problem. AMC had none of the tools necessary to make this plan happen. Have you guys ever tried to do anything without the proper tools? It's uh, nearly impossible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not fun. Uh, like putting together like an Ikea dresser and like you're like, oh, I don't have any of this stuff. Oh, man. I can't put together <laughs> my 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 skull hobbin. <laughs> yeah. It's like just like, oh, my tools are at work. Oh, no. I, my hands are going to hurt now. <laughs> oh, man. I really want to put together my Warhammer army, but I don't have tiny paintbrushes. <laughs> oh, I really... For a while, I was looking into Warhammer stuff just because, um, you <laughs> Dude, know, why not? You should totally do Warhammer. <laughs> Dude, I think, yeah. Is there like a game involved with it? Could we like play each other or something? We could play the computer version. So. Easiest, I think. Yeah, well, I'm just saying like I've, I've also been looking into hobbies, you know, considering the current situation. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking at like RC stuff. Oh, RC for um, sure. I'm getting back but, into that. Yeah, maybe like just like scale models in general that don't move. Um, I don't know, but we can we can talk offline about this. <laughs> but uh, I, you mentioned a hobby. I am one hundred percent down, and I think it'd be fun if we all got into the same one. I think that'd be super fun. Yeah, sweet. 
can't, I can't. Well, let's get through this script so we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Racing programs at the big three manufacturers were defined by their performance divisions, race engineering departments, and engine development teams. Developing a car that can be both a consumer success and winner at the track took a lot of resources, resources that AMC lacked. But, but somehow, AMC managed to scrape together two seasons, running on the absolute minimum imaginable for a factory team. Now, in 1968, they were the only team to finish every race, earning them a third-place finish out of three manufacturers. Yeah, not bad. Earning, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> In, in 1969, the Javelin was so far behind development-wise that the team resorted to using parts made by other manufacturers to make up the difference. An OEM front cross member was developed so the Jav could use suspension components from the Ford Mustang That's as so well as awesome. spindles. That's so like, I love that, dude. <laughs> I, you know, as well as spindles that could be fitted with the superior Lincoln disc brakes. Lead engineer Ronnie Kaplan even ordered a new engine block from the AMC foundry that allowed it to be used with Chevy connecting <laughs> rods for more engine stroke. I love this so much. They're just like, it's, dude, we can't do this on our own. Let's just lean <laughs> on everyone else. It's Is that I mean, like cheating? Is that legal? No, because they were like the OEM stuff. With, I mean, you could get that front. Um, so, like, you could buy that front cross member for your javelin and use Mustang parts and stuff. It's oh man, it's wild. That's I'm sure awesome. the other companies were like, "Yeah, you won because you used our freaking our parts." So it's a <laughs> it's like a way for them to you know flaunt their shit too. Yeah, I can imagine putting that on a 60s advertisement poster. And I don't think it was scrutinized very hard because at this time, they still weren't doing very well. So I think yeah. the, the the stewards kind of let it slide. Anyway. Yeah, continue. well, the when this stuff didn't work, they did start cheating. They made fiberglass <laughs> fenders to lighten the car. Uh, but when stewards tested the body panels with magnets to make sure they were stock, the jig was up. Yep. Fiberglass Things... is not magnetic. <laughs> Oh, we didn't we didn't know they had magnets. Oh, why didn't you say they had magnets? Oh. Is that like the racing equivalent of like biting a coin to see if it's metal? Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously things were not well at AMC. Um, and as a result, they finished dead last behind Chevy, Ford, and Pontiac, scoring only 14 points. After the last race at Riverside, Kaplan was obviously fired. <laughs> So who would AMC trust with their sinking racing program? If only they could get someone with back-to-back -back championship wins and an entire program of people who knew what the heck they were doing. If only. If only, man. If only. If only. If, if only. If, if only. <laughs> if only. Uh, driver Mark Donahue had won back-to-back -back championships with Roger Penske Racing behind the wheel of a navy blue Camaro sporting yellow wheels and red headlights. This thing is pretty gnarly looking. It's a but, McDonald's car. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's like Grimace, basically. <laughs> but despite the winning no, record... Yeah, it's like Oshkosh Bagosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Joe, but, you're from Wisconsin. What is the bagosh yeah. about? Uh, by gosh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's probably something <laughs> they say up there. So yeah, Mark Donahue is winning with that Camaro. But despite the winning record, things weren't very peachy between Penske Racing and Chevy. So Penske actually broke off the partnership. Uh, this is this was perfect timing for AMC. They offered Penske two million dollars, the equivalent of thirteen today to right the ship and get the Javelin some freaking wins. Uh, Penske accepted the offer and started by selling off the old race cars and equipment. Penske wanted to start fresh, and he only kept one Javelin so his team could establish a baseline to compare the new cars against. During testing, guys, they discovered that the Javelin suspension was pretty much bottomed out at all times, which made it even more impressive that Kaplan's team was able to drive the car at all. Penske engineer Ron Cox 
redesigned the entire rear suspension and also came up with a system that allowed the team to change out brake disc rotors as easily as brake pads, which helped them immensely during longer races because they spent less time changing those components out. Oh, for sure. The other teams were never able to figure out how the Penske team did that. And, but unfortunately, that's about the only thing the Penske Javelin team was able to pull off that year. The car was plagued with oil starving issues that they were never able to figure out. Penske was able to win three races that year, falling short of its preseason promise of winning seven. So I just imagine like the whole crew, like after the season and then they're just like feeling real down on their luck and just like sad. And they're like, one guy like pipes up and he's like, well, at least we can change our brakes really fast. <laughs> and everyone's like, yeah. I mean, that's something, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, then they just like look back into their beers. <laughs> <laughs> now, a rule change for 1971 meant that the cars could run with a dry sump setup, meaning the engine's oil was stored outside of the engine. And that solved the starvation problems that ruined their previous seasons. That is a very, very fortunate Rule change. Yeah. Well, it's one like Penske. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> if you can imagine this, Penske uh, lobbied heavily for this rule. Yeah, change. yeah. <laughs> I imagine. So, like <laughs> they like figured out like, all right, here's what we need to win. And he, I think he may have greased some palms and taken some guys out for some big old just honking steak dinners. Uh, I want to make a just like no one would watch it, but maybe a movie about just the um. The lobbying for that rule change. <laughs> um, it was a very good rule change. And now that the car could run, the Javelin was an absolute missile at the track, fulfilling Penske's promise of seven wins, finally earning AMC the championship they set out to get four years earlier. But the victory was bittersweet, as the other factory teams had backed out, citing the rising costs of Trans Am racing. Ugh, that sucks, dude. S so AMC wasn't able to claim that they had beat Ford, Chrysler, and GM, even if their competition was still driving them on track. However, the win did cement the brand as a plucky underdog and made the Javelin an all-time classic. With all this uncertainty in the world, feeling safe at home has never been more important. That's why I brought you here to talk to you about Simply Safe Home Security. They're longtime friends of the past guest podcast, the one that I am co-hosting, and for good reason. Simply Safe has made it easy to finally get comprehensive protection for your home. There's no technician or pushy salesperson that needs to come and disrupt you, get you away from your video games, away from your children. None of that. You don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fee or sign a two-year contract like some companies. You can get everything for just 50 cents a day. Right now, when you head to simplysafe.com slash gas... My listeners, you loyal D-holes, will get free shipping and a 60-day free trial. That's simplysafe.com slash G-A-S to make sure that they know that our show sent you. That's why the gas is on the end. That's simplysafe.com slash G-A-S. You know, from Simply Safe and all of us here, we wish you safety and a good health. When we left off last week, AMC had just won their first Trans Am championship. The year was 1971. It was a tumultuous time in America. The unrest of the 60s was still fresh in the minds of many Americans, as more of their fellow countrymen were in the streets protesting the ongoing Vietnam War. Inflation was rising rapidly as the economy was on the brink of another recession. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. Things weren't looking good, especially for the American Motors Corporation. Their bid to triumph over the big three in Trans Am was successful, but the victory was hollow as their competitors had pulled out of the sport the entirely. Races are also won with a Donahue Penske Javelin team. But how did an American car company's untimely demise lead to the assassination of a French automotive executive? Well, we're gonna find out. This is Past Gas. Welcome back to 
Back to Ask Gas, everyone. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my other hosts, James Pumphrey. <laughs> Hi. And Joe Weber. What's up, uh, Pass Gas Nation? Last week, we were talking about the Javelin and... Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really love the Javelin. I think it's... Me it's, too. Me it's too. It's so I cool. think it's such a... It's such a weird car. Like the design is just a little off. I think maybe because they're not around anymore, so none of the design cues have been carried on. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like this, the, the, the proportions Mustang's are still, actually a little bit off. Which right. Are, yeah. Like it's kind of like a weird, cool. They thing. look like Dexter's Laboratory. Cars. <laughs> yeah. Like they look like the parents' cars from Dexter's Laboratory. That's pretty funny. That's an astute. There are actually a bunch of javelins on Craigslist. That I was looking at mm-hmm. for a while. I would never actually go through with it, but I think they're pretty cool. I would eventually like, maybe not a Javelin, but definitely I would love to own an AMC, like a Hudson or a, uh, or a Rambler or a Nash at some point. Is the, is the Eagle the like wagon that's super high up? Yes, it is. Yeah, like a four-wheel drive wagon. Oh, yeah. So cool. Okay. Today, we're talking about the assassination of George Bess and... Uh, how AMC might have been inadvertently responsible for his death. Shall we get into it? Yeah. Uh, Frenchman Jean-Marc Rouillon decided he wanted Jean. to get involved. Jean. <laughs> that one's okay. Right. That, one's, that one on, that one's on I'll me. give that one to Joe. Okay, yeah, I'll start like... over. <laughs> Jean-Marc, <laughs> Frenchman Jean-Marc Rouillon decided he wanted to involve himself in some Spanish politics with the goal of bringing down Spain's fascist Franco government. Back in 1936, a vicious civil war had broken out in the country. Fighting was done between the Republicans, the ruling party made up of urban workers, farmers, and the educated middle class, versus uh, nationalist rebels, a coalition of military leaders, landowners, business owners, and the church. By mid-year, the nationalists captured nearly half of the country as well as Spanish territories like the Canary Islands and Spanish Morocco. In the months that followed, Spain was ravaged with atrocities committed by both sides, as both Republicans and nationalists looked beyond their borders for help. Around 40,000 foreigners came to the Republicans' aid, while nationalist leader General Francisco Franco asked fascist Italy and Nazi Germany for assistance, which they happily provided. After two years of brutal combat, the nationalists captured the capital of Madrid as most of the Republican forces were disbanded. After the war, Franco was given absolute power. Uh, He was not burdened with the obligation to consult his cabinet before making any legislation. Franco's government was extremely authoritarian in nature. A cult of personality was built around Franco and espoused that he had been sent by God to save Spain. People were encouraged to report any co-workers suspected of any, quote, leftist activities. Franco made any non-government union illegal, which took away any organizing power in the private sector. Franco ignored Spain's diverse heritage and instead heavily promoted, quote, traditional Spanish activities like bullfighting and flamenco dancing. Franco's government censored the media, making criticism illegal as late as 1970. Uh, I think you guys are probably getting the picture here. Yeah, it's just like right now. <laughs> uh, Franco was a bad guy, and Franco is Spain doesn't sound like a good place to be. And that's where yeah, Frenchman... kind of like right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where Frenchman Jean-Marc Rouillon comes into play. The Frenchman was based in the town of Toulouse, about a two-hour drive from the border with Spain. In the time since the Spanish Civil War, exiled Republican fighters had crossed the border into southern France, and they hadn't forgotten anything that Franco had put them through. The mood in the region was still very counter-revolutionary, even 30 years after Franco took power. Jean-Marc fashioned himself as a freedom fighter and was inspired to start his own counter-revolutionary group when he heard that Spanish police had assassinated one Salvador Puig Antique, a member of the anti-Franco Iberian Liberation Movement. Jean-Marc was radicalized by this killing, and he was not the only one. Jean-Marc and the other revolutionaries formed Groups de Action Revolutionaires Internationales, or GERI, and began (laughs) carrying out operations in Spain and southern France by robbing banks in Brussels, Paris, and Toulouse. GERI was able to fund their insurgent acts. 
They machine gunned the Spanish prime minister's car, sabotaged railways, burned buses, and bombed buildings. Eleven firefighters were seriously injured when Gary placed a bomb on the roof of a Spanish school. Then, when two of its members were arrested during a routine traffic stop, Gary was dismantled in 1979. But because they were arrested in France and not Spain, Jean and the other Gary were not charged with terrorism in that country and they were released. Jean-Marc Roulian took some time off from robbing and bombing and decided to regroup. So yeah, uh, I don't know if any clarification needs to be made there. Um, this seems like yeah, a movie. Clarify Have away. they not made a movie about this? Not yet, Joe. Uh, okay, first donut <laughs> production, huh? <laughs> yeah, this would definitely make a good movie for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah. Clarify, and, Nolan. I could, I could use a little clarification, even though I just read it. So this group, uh, Gary, um, in my research, it sounds like uh, there were a lot of groups like Gary at this time. Um, uh -huh. And they would like kind of pull, they would, you know, they would uh, do those attacks like the machine gunning of the car and the bombing and stuff like that. But it doesn't really seem like they were ever really successful at, at pulling off their goal. And mostly they just they just robbed a lot of banks. And because to them, that was also kind of an act of revolution, you know, because they were taking uh -huh. money from, you know, the, the financial institutions and they kind of fashioned themselves as like Robin Hood in that way. But usually that money just went to financing their own acts anyway. Dude, if they wanted to lead a revolution, why didn't they just drive across the country <laughs> as fast as possible? <laughs> That's how you really uh, make a change. Yeah, if you haven't listened to our uh, Cannonball Run series, uh, definitely check that out. Um, I don't know what Brock... What do you think Brock Yates would think of Gary? I think he'd be like, y'all wasting your time. All you need to do is get a Ferrari and drive really fast across the country, and then everyone will listen up. Yeah, if you think oh, about man. it, the fascist regime of Franco is pretty much the same as a 55-mile-per-hour speed limit. <laughs> Dude, I was thinking that. That's pretty much the exact same. Uh, Tony Angelo uh, texted me after that the first Cannonball came out. Uh huh. And he was like, Dude, uh, Brock Yates Jr. lives in my neighborhood. We get beers. That's sick. Like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, I think maybe when we're allowed to go get beers with people again, um, we can go get beers with him. Yeah, let's do that for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we go to Philly. We got to go to Philly, baby. <laughs> If we want to go, if we want to get beers, we got to go to Philly, baby. Donut does have like some good connection to Philly. Uh, Dude, fucking love Philly. Fucking my, the homie Russo's fucking Philly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Russo. Fucking Tony Angelo's from fucking Philly, baby. <laughs> let's go get some water in Philly. Yeah, let's go get some fucking water. <laughs> All Dude, right. I hate so. the fucking Celtics or something. <laughs> <laughs> I hate the fucking Celtics or something. I hate the fucking Braves. Anyway, AMC. You're, oh, you're a Braves fan? You're a Braves fan? Fuck you. <laughs> Drink uh, some water. Drink some water and eat a fucking cheesesteak. I fucking hate the Phillies. I hate the Braves. <laughs> and I hate the Bucks. Why do you hate the Phillies? No, I love the Phillies. What did I say? <laughs> I'm just so fucking mad. Give me a glass of water. Yeah, you need to calm down, man. Here, I love drink, Rocky. Drink that. I love drink Rocky. That. What yeah, are you, you talking got, about? You guys I made a statue Rocky. for Rocky. Yeah, you, you made love a statue Rocky. for him for some reason. <laughs> anyway, AMC was struggling in the late 70s. Uh, an economic slump a few years earlier had kneecapped sales, and the company was struggling to recover. Their Gremlin and Pacer compact cars had been decent sellers, but the best was behind them by 1979. The only thing keeping AMC in the black was loans and Jeep. AMC had acquired Jeep back in 1970, buying the brand from the Kaiser Corporation, who had bought it from Willys Overland seven years earlier. Hey, wait, quick, quick side note. Uh, I've been pronouncing Willys Jeep wrong this whole time. It's actually Willis Jeep. Oh, thank you, Joe. The guy who so knows everyone everything. is pronouncing it wrong. Willis. Yeah. All right. Willis Overland. Oh, I think thank you. also I think that um, we've been saying AMC wrong. Yeah, I think it's amp. How do you say? <laughs> amp. Okay, that makes yeah, way my more bad. sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amp. Okay. Uh, under I think the capitalization is what's confusing. It is all caps, but you don't say every letter. 
Right. Okay, really that did. makes sense. Uh, so yeah, they bought it from Willis Overland seven years earlier under Amp's ownership. <laughs> Uh, Jeep innovated by introducing the first automatic all-wheel drive system in 1972, and they introduced the iconic CJ7 in 1976. My dad had a CJ7, a white oh, that's, one. That's sweet. Did he only have white cars? Uh, he had a lot of them. He had a white Ranger. He had a white BMW. He had two white BMWs. White. Yeah, I think he liked white cars. I never thought about that. Maybe my dad was push a T. <laughs> uh, <laughs> i love push a t i love okay. push a t because like all right this guy all he does is talk about like being like a legit drug dealer right yeah cocaine cowboy like, dude yeah so he's like the most drug dealer of all the rappers but he was in clips and so like he's been famous since he was 17 years old probably 16 or 17 like involved in the music industry for you know, at, almost as long as like Justin Timberlake. Right. <laughs> so like Pusha T has just decided to do like drug dealer cosplay. <laughs> yeah. That's and like, true. that's his whole thing. Rick Ross is the same way. It's like, none of you guys sold drugs. Speaking yeah. of Justin Timberlake, the first uh, clip song I ever, or the first instance of clips I ever heard was in the Justin Timberlake song, uh, Like I Love You which has a verse by Pusha T on it. And it's actually it's Damn. pretty good. <laughs> it's a great song. I'm going to listen to that track. Oh, that yeah. That conversation came full circle real nicely. Back to the show. Back to the show. Uh, Jeep <laughs> produced a mail truck variant called the Dispatcher, a two-wheel drive CJ5 used by the United States Post Office. Uh, thanks to the rising popularity of off-roading in the U.S., Jeep enjoyed great sales throughout the 70s. Essentially, you're going to say thanks to the rising popularity of mail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So essentially, Jeep was carrying AMC on its back. However, the profit margin for AMC was so low that the slightest hit to the economy would mean AMC was done for. And as luck would have it, that's exactly what happened. Now, AMC had run up so much credit that no one would loan them any more money. So they started looking for a buyer. The company was too small for anyone in the U.S. looking to compete with the big three, but its small size did have an advantage. AMC was a perfect option for a large foreign automaker wanting to get in on the American market, and that's when French automaker Renault came into the picture. Meanwhile, back in France... Jean-Marc Rouillon still had a passion for guerrilla warfare and a desire it's to hard get... to give up. It's hard to kick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's tough. I'm trying myself, man. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> and he had a desire to get something done. So from the remnants of his dissolved Gary group, he formed a new one called Action Direct, or as we'll refer to them, uh, uh, Direct Action. Uh, Direct Action was a collaboration between former Gary members and another group called how I don't even know how to pronounce this. I'm going to do my best. Uh, no, yo, arm, po, autonomy, popular, uh, or N nap app for short. <laughs> my favorite nap app is the calm app. <laughs> We're not sponsored by them. <laughs> We're not. We could be calm. Hit us up. Info anyway. at donut.media. <laughs> nap app. You, you can hear Luke Perry say the velveteen rabbit <laughs> do they have luke i i, I want to listen to luke wilson in the uh the velveteen rabbit do they have that yeah option? they got luke wilson um reading wow. Stuart little <laughs> wow you know it was a good day for Stuart. And, uh, he was eating <laughs> carrots, and then he went over and he wanted to see mr badger so he knocked on mr badger's door it was a cute little house it's like a little animal house you know and like really <laughs> You know, reflected Mr. Badger's personality, which is a little grim and a little gruff. And then Mr. Badger came out, and even though he's like a little animal, he's got a front door. And he's got decorations inside of his house. And he wears a, a little suit, like a little man suit. And like, they personify him. Like, he's very personified really well. Like, he, he's a grumpy, Badger's a grumpy animal, so... He wears like the same kind of suit as like a grumpy, like kind of short, chubby guy with funny hair would wear, like in old, <laughs> in old England. That was amazing. 
<laughs> it's yeah. really good, dude. That's so good. It's great. It's, it's called the Nap App. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you get celebrities. We got celebrities, and they just read um, <laughs> stories from our childhood. That was incredible. Okay, so yeah, in 1979, uh, Nap App uh, restructured and vowed to carry out attacks in the name of anti-imperialism and quote proletarian defense. Uh, they wanted to fight for the little guy, but as this story progresses, I think their actions might have hurt more little guys than they helped. Uh, oh. Direct action carried out. <laughs> <laughs> direct action carried out nearly fifty attacks. They attacked French government buildings, French army buildings, property management buildings, arm man yeah. arms manufacturers, and carried out an attack Put on moratorium the moratorium on rent now. Uh, <laughs> Now, arms, okay, uh, and carried out an attack on the employers' union headquarters, uh, which was basically like there was, you know, there was labor unions, and then the employers' union was kind of like a cheeky name. This is where all the heads of industries would kind of hang out and try to uh, figure out how to best uh, the little guy. Basically, yeah. So if you yeah. made money exploiting the working class, or if direct action thought you did, uh, you were a target. Mm. Meanwhile. Back in America, <laughs> Renault had been looking for a way to get into the American market, but the logistics of bringing the company to U.S. soil was far too complicated. Plus, Renault didn't make a car that Americans would want to buy anyway. Renault made small cars for cramped cities. And while there are cramped cities all over this country, the thought of <laughs> buying a small car to navigate them has never really been that popular for some reason. I'm going to buy... I want to buy a Fiesta, Fiesta ST, baby. I would love one of those. Are they affordable yet? We'll talk. We'll talk offline okay. during the hobby conversation. <laughs> okay. Um, even though AMC sales were slumping hard, they at least had an idea of what kind of cars to build for Americans. So Renault jumped at the chance to buy a stake in the company. Renault bought fifteen million dollars in stock of AMC, which gave them five percent ownership, far from the controlling stake. But Renault would lend AMC $135 million, which then turned into stock in the company, allowing Renault to eventually take control. The French firm sent two representatives over to the U.S. who were given board member positions and allowed Renault to observe how AMC did business. And what they found made these guys go, Sacre bleu. <laughs> <laughs> now, tradition can be an important asset in a company as old as AMC, a chain that links everyone together, but it can also bind people to doing things wrong. Renault found out that AMC had a horribly... Ah. Shush. <laughs> Aw, little birdie. If you think about it, a bark is like a dog's way of saying sacre bleu. <laughs> yeah, my little dog was just saying... Sacre Blue, who's out there? <laughs> um, Renault found out that AMC had a horribly inefficient supply chain and manufacturing process that wasted lots of money and lots of time. And Business 101 tells us that time is money, baby. The workflows were smoothed out and the old guys running things were retired. And for the time being, Renault would finally bring one of their cars to American shores. It was called the Alliance. This drab sedan was also available as a convertible, and I can assure you, it is the most car-looking car ever built. Okay, guys? I want you guys to close your eyes. Let's do it. Unless you're driving, then keep them open. But let's do a little exercise, a little imagination vacation, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, imagine a car, all right? Just a basic car, okay? You got it in your head? I yeah. got it, yeah. Okay, more basic. Okay, okay. You visualizing it? I'm visualizing yeah. it. Okay. I'm seeing like a Mercury Grand Marquis, just like yeah, a yeah. square, and it's tan. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly where you're supposed to be at this point, Joe. Even more basic really? than that. Yeah, more basic. Yeah, I don't know how it can be more basic. <laughs> Shorter, I guess. No, but anyway, that's that's what the Alliance was. <laughs> it was just like the most boring car you could possibly imagine. I, so cool. my initial my initial response when you first said that was. Oh, Chrysler LeBaron. Yeah. And it looks like a LeBaron. Yeah, exactly. Should have gone with my gut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, super basic car looks 
a lot like a Chrysler LeBaron. It looks like it might be smaller, and it also looks like it's just kind of like, like, like someone took a <laughs> someone took a Chrysler LeBaron. And it was like, um, That's, I know what you're. I know what you mean by that. Despite how boring and basic and the hurtness of it, um, apparently. <laughs> It was good enough for Car and Driver because they named the Alliance their car of the year in 1983, which I think, like, I don't want to make any enemies in automotive in the automotive press. Um, like, the Chrysler, like, the Car and Driver Car of the Year doesn't mean anything. It's a fake list. It's, like, a fake award that gives they give to people who pay money. I don't know, man. I think we'll have to look into that. I'm going to disagree with you on that one. Dude, I got a hunch. Okay. <laughs> do you know the New York Times bestseller list has nothing to do with sales? I think we discussed that last week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's an interesting tidbit, boys, about this uh, Renault AMC acquisition. At the time, Renault was owned by the French government, meaning Dude. AMC was also owned by the French government. A problem arose when they realized that AMC had a subdivision called AM General, which produced vehicles for the military, like big 6x6 transport trucks. The French government was not allowed to own a defense contractor like AM General, so Renault sold off the AM General assets to General Motors. Included in those assets was the iconic seven-slot Jeep grille design and the Hummer name. That's what you call a come up! In the early 80s, AMC was doing okay, but the winds began to change once again. Their small car sales were flopping hard. If AMC wanted to survive the 80s, they needed something big. And that was a tall order since Renault themselves weren't doing super hot either. Back in France, it was perceived that AMC's troubles were weighing down Renault and by extension, the government. And oh <laughs> by double extension, the French people, because their taxes were covering Renault's losses. Dude, AMC's so bad at being a car company, they're going to tank a country. <laughs> <laughs> the options were either sell AMC or do something big. And Renault did something big. They hired one George Bess to run Renault. Bess had a reputation in France for turning things around and making them profitable again. But one key tactic for George's turnaround success was a particularly negative one. Uh, layoffs. He's like another Renault president, uh, Mr. Carlos Ghosn. Very, very true, Joe. Uh, there's a lot of parallels between uh, Bess and Ghosn. Uh, when acting as director of aluminum firm, uh, this, another French name I'm going to butcher, aluminum firm Pecine. U I think it's Pecini. Pekini Ugini Coleman. Pekini <laughs> Ugini Coleman. Uh, Bess ordered the layoff of 30,000 employees. Oof. Yeah, you could call George a lot of things, but not inconsistent because his first directive at Renault was to lay off 21,000 people. George Bess was now responsible for 51,000 people losing their job, and some people might have seen that as an anti working class move. I think you. I think you could say that out of the side of your mouth if you wanted to. No, nah, I. No. Yeah, no. 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 Nolan, I think you've earned it. All right. Some people might have seen that as an anti-working class move. <laughs> I think it's like okay, that, some people like you got it because remember we've been talking about Gary and all these like revolutionary people who are sticking up for the little guy. Okay. And so like I yeah. think you should really hit that some people because then all we're right. like oh we've been talking about those people. Some people might have seen that as an anti-working class move. Thank you. Thank you. No, I feel foreshadowed. Good. Within 20 months of Georges taking the reins, Renault was profitable again, and he started investing more money into AMC. Despite the pressure from the French public to let the company go, after all, these workers he laid off were union employees, and yet he wanted to send more money to the U.S.? That's an entirely different country. It was hard for a lot of people to accept, but Georges believed that the key to AMC's success, and by extension, Renault's, was making big innovations at Jeep. The SUV craze was on the horizon, and Georges wanted Jeep to lead the way. Georges approved the development of a 4-liter inline-six engine, an engine that would be used in the Jeep Cherokee SUV, and honestly, it's one of the top 10 
maybe one of the top 10 engines of all time. It really Super is. Super reliable. Gets the job done. You can drive them till three gajillion. I mean, there's like million mile motors out there. Yeah. My buddy, Cody, has a, uh, his family has a Cherokee with like 350,000 miles on it. And it still runs like a champ. Yeah. It's a great, great engine. So things are going great for George until November 16th, 1987. On his ride home from Renault headquarters, uh, George was probably reading some documents that he didn't have time for at the office, as was his routine. He probably didn't notice the two women pushing a baby stroller down the sidewalk. As his car approached the curb, his daughter waited by the second story window like she did every night. George stepped out of the car as the women approached him. The women said nothing as they fumbled with the blanket in the stroller. It wasn't carrying a baby, but two guns. One of the women opened fire, hitting George four times before he fell to the sidewalk. After shooting George, the assailants dropped their guns and ran to a pair of waiting motorcycles, one of which was driven by Jean-Marc Rouillon. Direct action had just hit their last and most high-profile target. The four of them went into hiding, as direct action claimed responsibility for George's death in a letter sent to newspapers three months later. They cited George's layoffs as a cause for retaliation, as his, quote, imperialist capitalist actions had directly affected workers in France. The four of them, Natalie Menillon, uh, Joël Abron, J George Cipriani, and leader Jean-Marc Rouillon were found shortly after the direct action letter was published, hiding out in a farmhouse in Orleans, a hour and a half south of Paris. During their respective trials, all four assassins denied any involvement in the shooting, despite the fact that police found the original letter claiming responsibility when they raided the farmhouse. Well, do they want to take uh, responsibility for it or not? Because they seem like I think they're like, proud of I'll, it, but they don't want to go to jail kind of thing. Yeah, it's like you want to be proud of it until you're like until there's arrested. consequences. Yeah, and then you're like, ah, turns out this fucking sucks. Ah, man. The fame was great, but these prison bars kind of suck. Yeah, like last podcast on the left is doing like a really deep, like super multi-part series on uh, um, the Kennedy assassination. And like apparently right after uh he did it or quote unquote did it uh lee harvey oswald was just like instant regret like oh man i didn't really think this through and i think like that's the case for like a lot of these quote unquote yeah. revolutionaries which like it's like you're not running for office you're not like playing by the rules of the system you're not like really affecting change at all you're like robbing banks and killing people and like probably like smoking a bunch of cigarettes, drinking wine and like effing each other. And they're yeah. like basically like pulling a push of tea and like doing like revolutionary <laughs> cosplay. That was great. They brought it back full circle. Thanks, so after George's death, Renault replaced him with a guy named Raymond Levy, who gave into the pressure and sold off AMC. He was afraid that if AMC went under, it could have meant more layoffs back home at Renault. And he understandably didn't want to risk his life for America's smallest automaker. So in March of 1987, Renault sold the American Motor Corporation to Chrysler for a cool $1.5 billion. And Chrysler soon split the company up into two brands, Jeep and Eagle. And just like that, AMC was no more. That's, that, that's the story. A bop, dude. That is a story. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing just during the research for this, how attached I got to AMC. I have like such a new kind of uh, appreciation for the brand, even though they mm -hmm. had a lot of issues, they still made some very interesting cars. And also just the whole, this, the story with jean roc Rion and direct action is just like, so it's bizarre. And <laughs> it's crazy. It's bonkers. It's absolute certified begong onkers. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I, I had a lot of uh, fun um, researching this one for sure. Yeah, this was it. it I was like confused at first because it was like two different stories going on at once. But uh, it's kind of like AMC was assassinated as well. Yeah, and Damn, um, you know that you know direct action. They wanted to get back and get some revenge for the working class. But I think 
you know, after the breakup of ANC, who's, you know, I couldn't find any hard numbers on this, but I'm, I'm, I, I have to imagine that when AMC was broken up, that a lot of people lost their jobs as well. So mm -hmm, really, yeah. how much of the working class did these guys actually protect with this action? I don't think it was very many. As far as like uh, current events goes, like it, it makes me think like, oh, shit, like Carlos Ghosn very well could be assassinated or like kidnapped and brought back to Japan or some kind of shit like that because he basically did the same thing. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, he has he has like what is it, like ex Green Berets protecting him in Lebanon. Yeah, right he has now, a 13 right? million dollar bounty on his head, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we're de <laughs> the, the Gone story is definitely not over, but I would not be surprised if there's any sort of violence in it like we like we saw today in this story. Yeah, we're more. not condoning any violence. We're just saying like it's very possible with these trying times. Um who do you think owns like the AMC name? That's a good question. I don't know. Um do you want to buy it? <laughs> I think it'd be cool if Donut bought AMC. That would be so be really amazing. Cool. Um there's like a a really clean stock eagle uh like two blocks away from me and i always just like slow down to look at it when i drive past it it's so that's cool. such a bizarre looking car yeah because it's like a wagon dude. but it's also like a little small right like it's yeah and it's lifted. lifted the lifted yeah. part is the <laughs> yeah. craziest part yeah it's all wheel drive it's crazy it's, it's so cool well thank um, you guys so much for listening nolan what do we got coming up next week Ooh. I think our next topic is the uh, we're going to do a big series on a certain motorcycle gang. Um, should we reveal it now? I think I mean, there's only one motorcycle gang that we would cover. Uh, we're going to be doing a the series. Biker boys. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> the Mayans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to do a series on the uh, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, no. Um, uh, the Hells Angels. We're doing a series on the Hells Angels. Uh, I've already started doing some preliminary research, and we're gonna try to we're gonna try to separate fact from fiction and find out what the real story is. Because there's a lot of there's such a a, a uh, well not iconic but infamous group that uh, there's a lot of they're lot incorporated. Of they're they're like incorporated. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna be doing the Hell's Angels next week, so stay tuned for that. Uh, should yeah. be very interesting. Also, we have just launched what we're calling Donut Every Day. Uh, we have an upload every day of the week. So make sure that you support um, every donut show or at least check it out and uh, see if you like it. Uh, we like all of them. So every Monday we have Nolan's show Wheelhouse. Every Tuesday we have Bumper to Bumper with our buddy Jeremiah. Jeremiah is truly, we, we had him on the podcast for two episodes. Uh He's truly one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Uh, right. so. He does everything. He he races motorcycles on the weekends, like supercross and motocross. Yeah, and uh, street bikes. Like actually races them, not just like rides them. Like he goes and races. Um, he's nine and a half feet tall. <laughs> he's handsome. Uh, he's got he's got great the proportions style. of Woody from Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chiseled. So that's Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, uh, another handsome guy, uh, Zach Job is hosting Money Pit. You remember Zach Job from High Low? He was my team high um, teammate. Thursday is my show, Up to Speed. Friday is another show that I host called The D List, um, and every that it's a list show. <laughs> it's a different car list show every week. It's super fun. Um, we sort of started it. Um, because I'm stuck in my garage and I don't have anything else to do. So we gave me a new show. Um, and then Saturday is another new show called Versus, uh, hosted by our buddy Joey. And then, of course, every Sunday um, on our Donut podcast channel on YouTube, we have Past Gas uh, with Joe Weber, me, and Nolan. Um, and so that's that's seven that's seven a week. So that's Donut Every Day. And then uh, I just want to clarify that the podcast, if you're listening to it, yes, it will still come out on Monday everywhere that you get your podcasts. Let us know on our subreddit if you want to hear about any particular subject on the podcast. We're always looking for new stories to tell. 
Uh, sure. Yeah, so follow Donut on at Donut Media on all social. Uh, follow James Pumphrey at James Pumphrey as well. Follow Joe at Joe G Weber, and follow me at Nolan J Sykes. Um, be kind. I love uh, you. See you next time. Fired up, Joe. Fired Drag up. It. There we go. Wink, wink. <laughs> oh, God. wink, wink. Fired up. <laughs> <laughs> But it's getting a little hot in here, so I'm going to take my sweatshirt off. But for everybody, for everyone following along at home, it's just getting a little toasty in the old garage because the sun's coming up. So I'm going to take my sweatshirt off. Do you ever sit on that couch behind you? Oh, he took his headphones off.